Henry David Thoreau, an early American author and transcendentalist, says, We need the tonic of wildness. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be indefinitely wild, unsurveyed, and unfathomed by us because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. The natural world plays an integral role in American literature, just as it does in our lives. The United States is a country of varied landscapes and diverse ecosystems, bursting at the seams with natural beauty. Its breadth and depth of natural wonder is captured in the pages of countless writers. In literature and in life, nature is a study in contrasts. Nature can be friend and foe a giver of resources and deliverer of drought and pestilence. For every sunny blue sky day, there's a dark evening of destructive storms. The natural world can be a balm for a troubled heart or an uncaring and partial force for us to test our mettle against. Regardless of what form it takes, nature has been inspiring authors for centuries. Our writers for this week will present nature in various forms and describe different facets of the human nature relationship. Despite these unique portrayals, it is likely they would all agree with Aristotle when he says, in all things of nature, there is something of the marvelous. Sarah Orne Jewett was born in 1849 and died in 1909. She was born in Maine, with her birth name Theodora Sarah Orne Jewett, the second of three daughters of Caroline Perry Jewett and Dr. Theodore Herman Jewett. And Jewett was plagued by arthritis for most of her life, and she was often ill as a child. As a result, she was frequently absent from school, and she would end up traveling with her father, who was a physician, as he made his rounds to his patients' houses, which really gave her an up-close and personal view of the lives of New Englanders living on the coasts. She was educated at Miss Rain's school and Berwick Academy, but considered the trips with her father as her best education. She thought about a career in medicine when she graduated, but her poor health um, prevented her from pursuing this option. She's considered a local color artist, which means that she sought to accurately portray her native Maine by focusing on the history, dialect, mannerisms, geography, and culture of the region. So Jewett later in life became part of a literary circle, which included James T. Fields and his wife Annie Fields. And Annie was a friend of Jewett since um, she was a young girl. And James died in 1881, and as a result, Annie and Sarah became even closer friends. They toured Europe together, and they actually ended up living together for six months of every year in the same house. And this close relationship between two financially independent intellectual women was known as a Boston marriage. It's possible that Annie and Sarah may have been involved in a lesbian relationship, but there's not enough evidence to say for sure. The two visited while they were together and entertained many literary figures of the time period, so Jewett was very much steeped in the artistic culture of her time. And Willa Cather, who's another famous American author, really learned a lot from Jewett and had sort of a teacher-pupil relationship with her. In 1901, Jewett became the first woman to receive an honorary doctorate from Bowdoin College, where her father attended school. Unfortunately, though, on her 53rd birthday, Jewett fell from a carriage, suffering head and spinal injuries, which brought her literary career to an end. In 1909, she suffered a stroke and died as a result of a cerebral hemorrhage in June of that year. E.E. E. Cummings was born in 1894 and died in 1962. His full name is Edward Estelin Cummings, and he was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His father was a minister who also taught at Harvard. Cummings went to Harvard, graduated, and then eventually earned an MA in 1916. And Cummings started off writing more traditional poetry, but he then read Ezra Pound's writing and began to become more experimental with form and structure and content. So Cummings actually moved to Greenwich after a stint as an ambulance driver in France during World War I. And he continued to visit France, though, um, and his family's New Hampshire home after moving to Greenwich. In addition to being a poet, Cummings was also a painter. Through a combination of frugal spending, money from his art, both written and, you know, physical, and an allowance from his mother, Cummings really was able to make a living as an artist full-time. And Cummings' work really exhibits experimental forms like we expect from the modernist movement. And also a main theme we see in his work 
is that of the individual in opposition to society and a celebration of nonconformity and going against the status quo. And unlike some of the other modernists, Cummings really wanted his art to be accessible and understandable you know, to a wide audience. The weird structure and capitalization rules of his poems, as well as his, his strange and often sometimes lack of use of punctuation, are all kind of focused on presenting an image of the poem on the page. So it's not only pleasant to read, but also pleasant or thought-provoking to look at. And as the Norton biography for him says, that to express his sense that life was always in process, Cummings wrote untitled poems without beginning and endings, consisting of fragmentary lines. So kind of all aspects of Cummings' poetry sort of ties into his sort of eccentric view on reality in general. Jack London was born in 1876 and died in 1916. And London was born and spent most of his life in California, but he took frequent trips to Alaska, the Pacific Rim, and Hawaii. He was born John Griffith Cheney, and was an illegitimate son of Flora Wellman and William Henry Cheney. They sort of had an open relationship, um, but William ended up leaving Flora when he learned she was pregnant. Flora later married John London, and then Jack became... John London, or Jack London as he was known. He had two stepsisters, Eliza and Ida. When he was a teen, London purchased a ship called the Razzle Dazzle. He spent time as an oyster pirate, which is another name for an oyster poacher, but then later worked to catch oyster pirates with the California Fish Patrol. He spent time as a sailor and a tramper, um, which means he traveled the U.S. looking for work and was sort of homeless and just wandering. He was actually arrested for vagrancy during this time. And as he was sort of touring the country working these odd jobs, he became very disillusioned with capitalism and joined the Socialist Labor Party. He ended up returning to high school so he could be accepted into the University of California, Berkeley. He did uh, achieve that and studied there for one semester, but sadly had to drop out due to a lack of funds. Jack London's big break, though, came when the Klondike Gold Rush of 1897 to 1898 occurred. He went up to Alaska with his brother-in-law, while there, he listened to stories of the North from both the seasoned old-timers and the newbies, Chicaquos, which we see in To Build a Fire. After this, London devoted himself to becoming a professional writer. He married Bessie Mattern the same year he published his first book. They had two daughters, Joan and Becky. He later married Charmaine Kitteridge when he divorced Bessie, and he and his second wife um, attempted to have children, but one was still born and the other one died a few hours after being born. And London really devoted himself to the craft of writing. Supposedly, he sometimes wrote for 15 to 19 hours a day in a lot of different genres. While he was writing, he had to navigate the divide between the market and art. So sometimes he had to cater his writing to what the reading public wanted to read. And other times he was able to indulge more in what he wanted to write, which was usually a little bit more literary, a little bit more artistic. And we can actually see that in the fact that he published two versions of To Build a Fire, one has a happier ending and is targeted more at young people, um, and the version we're reading is targeted more to adults and is kind of a little bit more literary, a little bit less straightforward. He's most famous for The Call of the Wild and White Fang, two of his biggest novels. And he was actually the first American writer to earn a million dollars from his writing, so a very prolific and successful writer. In the final years of his life, he suffered from poor health, and he most likely died from kidney failure. One of our more contemporary writers, Mary Oliver, was born in 1935 and died in 2019. And she was born and raised in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Her parents were Edward William Oliver, a teacher, and Helen M. Blasick Oliver. When she was young, she escaped a difficult home life by spending time in the woods. She reports suffering from parental neglect and sexual abuse when she was young. She attended Vassar College and Ohio State University, but did not end up with degrees from either institution. She was very fond of the work of Edna St. Vincent Millay, a major American poet, and she actually spent some time living in Malay's home, helping Malay's sister sort through her papers. Later in life, Mary and her partner Molly Malone Cook moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts, and this Cape Cod environment had a major impact on her writing. And Mary Oliver is very famous for writing um, essays and poetry about nature, and we can also sort of trace inspiration from the transcendentalists, earlier American writers like Emerson and Thoreau, who wrote really extensively about nature, and explored that connection between spirituality and the natural world, which we see reflected in Oliver's work as well. So again, we're kind of seeing her as part of this spectrum of American writers, um, going back to 
earlier in America's literary history. Her work has earned her several awards, including a Pulitzer. She worked as a faculty member at Bennington College. And kind of interestingly, if we think about her as part of the spectrum of American writers, she said of poetry, poetry, to be understood, must be clear. It mustn't be fancy. I have the feeling that a lot of poets writing now, that they sort of tap dance through it. I always feel that whatever isn't necessary should not be in the poem, which sounds very similar to some of the ideas of Ezra Pound and the other Imagists. And Oliver's poetry is known as being very accessible, but also very powerful. So one of the reasons why she's such a popular writer nowadays is that her poetry is very easy to understand, um, but also packs a lot of emotion into it. She unfortunately died in 2019 from lymphoma. Rachel Carson was born in 1907 and died in 1964. She was born in Springdale, Pennsylvania to Robert Warden Carson, an electrician and insurance agent, and Maria McLean Carson. And Maria was a very influential individual in Carson's life. Rachel also had an older sister, Marion, and a brother, Robert. As a child, Carson was a good student, but she often missed school as a result of illness and her mother's fear of contagious diseases that would be present in the school. When she was absent, she and her mother would take nature walks, with her mother teaching her about the natural world. So from a young age, she developed a strong interest in nature. She attended the Pennsylvania College for Women and played on the school's basketball team. She majored in English at the time. But later on, Mary Scott Skinker, Carson's biology teacher, who was another important figure in her life, inspired her to change her major to natural science. She did so and earned her undergraduate degree and was then accepted into Johns Hopkins University's graduate zoology program. Before attending grad school, though, she completed a research stint at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and this kind of just furthered a lifelong love of and fascination that Carson had with the ocean, which we clearly see reflected in undersea. Carson had to support her family while she completed her graduate degree. She was able to finish her master's degree in marine biology and began a PhD program. Unfortunately, she had to drop out after her father's death and when financial constraints made it impossible for her to continue. Carson got a job writing for the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, which later became part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When her sister died, she took over the raising of her nieces, moving to Silver Spring, Maryland to do so. And her article, Undersea, was published in the Atlantic Monthly and eventually morphed into and inspired her first work, Under the Sea Wind. In addition to her fascination with the ocean and the sea, Carson had a long interest in wildlife conservation. We can see this in her most famous work, Silent Spring, which revealed the way DDT, a pesticide, was negatively affecting bird life. And this was a major moment of the environmental movement and is often credited as kind of helping to further environmental causes in the United States. Um, Carson never married, but she had a very close friend, Dorothy Freeman, who may again possibly have been her lesbian partner. We again don't have enough evidence to really know for sure what the true nature of their relationship was like. Later in life, Carson's health began to decline as a result of cancer. She had a mastectomy, um, but kept her condition secret from the public. She was very private with her life, and this was true at the end of her life as well. And she died of a heart attack in 1964, which sometimes could be a side effect of receiving treatment for cancer.